Welcome to the 2021 Millennium Innovation Forum. Its lineup of internationally renowned speakers is guaranteed to stir your heart and open your mind. Be prepared for ideas, inspiration, and access to collaborative networks that unlock new possibilities for you and your organization. Our focus is on how research, knowledge, and innovation impact the well-being of people and the future of our world. Innovations for a better life. Hello and welcome, one and all, attendees in the studio and everyone online to the Millennium Innovation Forum. My name is Jason Palmer, and it's an honor for me today to guide you through the program as your moderator. Um, I'll tell you a bit about the program as we start after some opening remarks. There will be three themed sessions, talks each followed by questions and roundtable discussions. Each has a dedicated rapporteur who will be taking careful notes and writing a summary of the sessions that will be published on the Technology Academy Finland website. Now, after each of those three sessions, we'll have two We'll have three so-called uh, so future bazaars, uh, virtual visits to Millennium Technology Prize partner organizations with the theme Breakthrough Technologies for a Better Life. There's also a partner lounge with virtual booths for networking. And later in the day, a uh, grand final of the Millennium Pitching Contest aimed at doctoral candidates and is supported by the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters, Finnish Industry Investment Limited, and the Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences in Finland. Then we'll have the 2020 Millennium Technology Prize Lecture. We'll hear from the winners who were announced last night, and you'll be able to ask them questions about their pioneering work. After that, we'll meet the awardees of the Millennium Youth Prize 2021, and we'll meet the new chair of Technology Academy Finland. First, though, a bit of housekeeping. Um, as ever, you have to know where the fire exits are, look around you, they are wherever they are in your home and office. Today's event will be live tweeted by the Millennium Technology Prize, which you can find on Twitter at Millennium Prize. Please do follow along, retweet at will, and use the official hashtag MIF2021. It's the Millennium Innovation Forum 2021 for the Millennium Technology Prize 2020 in much the same way and for the same reason that we're waiting for the 2020 Olympics still. Um, as you know, since you're already in, uh, in it, the whole program takes place in the Brella platform, but I just want to point out some features of it before we get started. Most importantly, you can submit questions and make comments anytime in the chat function, which I believe is up there. Please do use it. We'll all get a lot more out of the program if you do. Uh, also, in that same direction are polls. Uh, on a, during a couple of the sessions, we'll have a couple of questions that you can respond to and that will in turn inform the discussions that we have. Now, in the People tab at left, and, and also tomorrow, you can schedule one-to-one -one meetings with your fellow participants. Have a look around. In this strange time, we need to find networking opportunities where we can. And something a bit more fun back up there is the photo booth, where you can take uh, pictures with interesting backgrounds. I invite you again to, to tweet them and use the hashtag MIF2021. Now, for our opening session, we're going to hear from Maria Makarov, the chair of Technology Academy Finland. Maria, please come to the stage. Professor uh, Shankar Bala Subramanian, Professor David Klenerman, I wish to congratulate you very warmly for winning the 2020 Millennium Technology Prize for the next generation sequencing technology. One of the technology's urgent and groundbreaking application has been unraveling the genetic code of coronavirus, which has enabled rapid development of vaccines. For participants who join us only now, the prize was awarded to the winners yesterday by the President of the Republic of Finland, Mr. Sauli Niinist. Your Excellencies, honored guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, while celebrating today the awarding of the ninth Millennium Technology Prize, let me reflect on the very first one. 
Yuval Noah Harari, in his short history of Homo sapiens, proposes that Homo neanderthaliensis, some 30,000 years ago, was overcome by us, Homo sapiens, due to our better communication skills that enabled sharing of information and thereby forming stronger communities. Written communication was born when pictography evolved to alphabet some 4,300 years ago in Egypt or Syria. And multiplication and spreading of writings became possible 580 years ago with the printing press, the groundbreaking innovation of Johannes Gutenberg. And we are witnessing the third breakthrough in communication, the digital revolution, which was started by the World Wide Web, for which Tim Berners-Lee got the very first Millennium Technology Prize in 2004. Now, to date, digitalization is changing everything. The way we learn, the way we communicate, teach, the way we transport, manufacture, the way we work and do business. In the most innovative vaccine ever, the anti-corona RNA vaccine is not enough to rescue us from the pandemic without the internet. Instrumenter for epidemiological modeling, tracing of infected patients, and remote working and learning. Data per se has become an asset. And sharing of data delivers huge multiplier effects for research and innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, science heals. Science helps save the environment. Science finds new energy sources. Science underpins mitigation of grand challenges, but not alone. Only when science meets finance that supports translation of technologies into innovations, supports commercialization of technologies, and scaling up of companies. But let's, call, let's recall, however, that technological solutions are not viable unless accepted by the civil society. Therefore, the knowledge of experts in the areas of human behavior, economy, legislation, ethics, are crucial for adoption of new technologies. Suffice it to highlight one single example. Scientists who more than 100 years ago developed drugs, vaccines, and antibiotics have so far saved billion lives. However, the impact depended on simultaneous social innovations at that time. For instance, hygiene practices and sewage systems. To date, science advice to political decision makers can support their strategies uh, to eradicate the pandemic and strengthen societal resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1 million euro Millennium Technology Prize was created by the state of Finland together with high-tech industries and academic institutions to celebrate groundbreaking innovations that sustainably enhance people's lives and deliver economic growth by creating new markets. All of our winners have created new knowledge and translated it to economic value in their respective domains, medicine, chemistry, physics, and ICT. Their fundamental research continues to sparkle new ideas for applications, and their applicational pathways in turn provide new questions for research. I wish to welcome the speakers and participants to the very first edition of the Millennium Innovation Forum, organized in honor of the MTP winners who will deliver their talk later today in the closing session. Thank you very much. Now it is my pleasure to invite to the stage Mr. Mika Lintila, Minister of Economic Affairs, to deliver his opening remarks. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. Welcome to everyone participating in the Millennium Innovation Forum 2021. It's a great honor to open this event uh, that celebrates the vital role of research, knowledge and innovation in our society and, and the economy. Before getting started, I, 
I would like to express my congratulations to Technology Million Prize winners, Professors Sankar Balasubramanian and David Glenerman. Congratulations. I will begin with a few words on the topic that brings us here today, the role of research and innovation in sustainable development of the economy and society. It's clear that innovation is a key driver of sustainable growth and productivity. Innovation-led growth is essential for ensuring meaningful life, employment and well-being. The import importance of innovation is clear. But let me first start by reflecting on where innovation comes from and what it is for. First, innovation comes from new knowledge, radical creativity and inspirational thought. Second, innovation comes from focus, discipline and patience. Third, innovation comes from identifying challenges. Indeed, the most powerful and greatest innovation in our history comes from the need to solve real-life problems. The next industrial revolution is already here. 3D printing, wearable technology, robots, driverless cars will soon be everywhere. They will make the work of humans easier and faster. Industrial robotics paved the way for fully automated production lines. Digitalization and use of data hold was the potential to move us towards carbon neutral economies and societies. Its potential for changing the way we generate and use energy can hardly be understood. Digitalization enables a clean energy revolution. In the next decade, we can expect innovation breakthroughs that we cannot even imagine today. For, for instance, artificial intelligence provides sustain, uh, substantial productivity increase for many sectors. Cheaper and more accurate predictions, machine learning, big data and uh, computing power AI will help address complex challenges like climate change and energy consumption. A concrete and actual example of the use of AI techniques is understanding and analyzing the coronavirus. AI text and data mining tools can <coughs> uncover the virus history, transmission, diagnostic, and of course, lessons from previous epidemic. Innovation can originate from necessity. As an example, the current coronavirus pandemic has shown how necessity challenges is smartest, uh, uh, smartest of minds and research providers to focus solving a massive problem. The corona pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation and spurred green and health innovations. Green and digital twin transition, for instance, has been integrated as part of the European Recovery Growth Package. Investment in science and innovations is essential in enabling these ambitious renewable and growth objectives. The pandemic has become a major catalyst for innovation. It creates opportunities for more open science and for the increased public engagement in science and innovation efforts. Getting science out of the lab in the hands of those who need it is not an easy task. Increasing levels of openness about how science can contribute to society is one thing, but we need new ways and approaches to catalyze this dissemination of scientific discoveries to innovate. Dear ladies and gentlemen, 
investing in science and innovations is increasingly crucial for shaping a better future for citizens of our planet. Let me be clear, success depends even more on the production and transferring new knowledge to the benefit of society. Sir Alexander Fleming's penicillin example shows that lack of proper funding can delay and even stop vital discoveries from benefiting humankind. One must also remember, it was not an institution that made this discovery. It was made by a human. Millennium Technology Prize is Finland's tribute to innovations for a better life. It celebrates innovation that have a positive and sustainable impact on quality of life and well-being of people. The Millennium uh, Technology Prize is awarded to technological innovations that benefits millions of people around the world. It also aims stimulating further cutting-edge research and development in science and technology. Turning scientists' discovery into real-world solution is certainly not an easy task. It requires expertise and new incentives that encourage and inspire scientists, in innovators and companies work together and translate scientific discoveries to the benefit of the people. It's my great honor and privilege to address the Millennium Innovation Forum audience today by using a momentum prompted by the global pandemic, a can-do attitude from our political leaders, global businesses and local communities provide fantastic opportunities to build a sustainable future globally now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Lintina. Now, let's move on to session number one, the big picture. This session looks at the big challenges and how research and technology can tackle them alongside sustainable growth, as we were hearing, the ties between tech and finance and policy. The session's chair will be an already familiar name, TAF Chair uh, Maria Makarov, and I would encourage you again to put some questions into the chat function still up there somewhere. Uh, we will address them uh, when we get to the questions part of the panel. Now, uh, to introduce your panelists, they are Bengt Holmstrom, Nobel laureate in economics and a professor at MIT, Nina Coppola, the director general of Business Finland, and Carl Henrik Svanberg, chair of the European Roundtable of Industrialists and the board of AB Volvo Swin Sweden. If all of the uh, contributors can join us. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session one, entitled The Big Picture. Our session strapline maintains that research and technology drive innovations and economic growth are crucial for mitigation of grand challenges. However, a lot has to be in place for this to happen. Our panelists will explore what prerequisites need to be fulfilled, what policies, instruments, organizations, agencies, financial instruments especially, and mindsets are needed for investments in research to turn into economic value, sustainable growth, and resilient societies. So we will start with short interventions by all three of our panelists, followed by a general discussion. Our first speaker is Bengt Holmstrom, remotely from Boston. Hello, Bengt. You advise Hello. governments uh, on economics at large, but also on the role of science and innovation for growth. The floor is yours, Bengt, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me 
to this uh, grand event and congratulations to the to the prize winners uh, 2020 it's uh, and a thank you to them also for for helping the world fight this uh, coronavirus so uh, i will uh, i will kick it off and my my topic that i've chosen is to talk about digitalization and uh, because a lot is happening in that space we have heard about digitalization for for years decades but I think there has been a, a, a discontinuity, almost one might say, in, in the application of digitalization. And uh, it, much of it is coming from, from China, actually. And, uh, and so I want to, I want to spe spend a moment about explaining that. And the uh, and, uh, United States is also a big player. So I will then go on and say a few, raise a few concerns about the fact that, uh, that uh, Europe is, is seems to be falling behind in this uh, in this uh, development and uh, i will close then by basically suggesting some ways in which uh, europe may may draw lessons from from the uh, american system or mainly because that's where i'm uh, that's what i'm familiar with so that's what's on the table uh, i it's really the, the, the big leap, so to speak, is coming from China, basically from the fact that, uh, that they developed earlier than anybody else a mobile payment system. And on the back of the mobile payment system that was meant to support their, their trading platform, called, which most of you are familiar with, called Alibaba. And it's the combination of the mobile payment system with the platform uh, that made it, gave led to explosive growth and through various sequences of expansion into an ecosystem led to the really big deal here which is that uh, the mining of data and using data for the purpose of uh, portraying uh, you know characteristics of people and also being able to serve them in better ways so we hear a lot about data as a as a scary thing and this accumulation of data i want to make the case or actually saying there's a lot of positive stuff going on. And in China, the best illustration of this is, is uh, that uh, they have really been able to expand, you know, the reach of, of, uh, of, of credit, of, uh, of products and others from the east to the western part of China, which was really underserved, especially with regard to credit and banking. So this is a very positive development and part of the fact that China actually has, has really dramatically gotten rid of poverty. And, uh, and so uh, to give you just some sense of, 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 you know, the US, you know better, the US has similar platforms as, as China does, similar data mining to some extent. But uh, the structure is a little bit uh, different, and, and I don't. I hope that when we can get to the discussion, we can get to those uh, those issues. But uh, let me give you some facts that that uh, support the view that uh, Europe is not really uh, hanging in there, and and that comes from first of all, if you look at the top ten uh, companies by market cap, uh, seven of them are platform based businesses. Uh, eight of them are U.S., two of them are Chinese. As of the last time I looked, it may have changed by now, market cap is moving. The thing that really is the most shocking piece is that, uh, that uh, if you look at the 100 most valuable startups in the world, globally, uh, there are exactly two companies from EU. There are nine companies from UK, but UK is no longer EU. So there are only two companies, one from Sweden, Klarna, and one from Estonia. Uh, that's, uh, I think it was called Bolt. There's not a single company from Central Europe. You know, somehow that to me is an alarming lesson. It is true that it's about startups. It's true that it's about market cap, but still, you know, it tells that we are not really in the game when it comes to, 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 to uh, these developments. And, uh, you know, 
I think we should discuss the reasons. I think people should think about the reasons because uh, if you fall behind in digitalization, I think you really fall behind in the economic development. And, uh, and so this is an urgent call for thinking about it. I think you, Europe has made a, a, a decision to go for whatever the reason is, but, but one of the things they're doing, they're big on regulating. But there is, uh, there is uh, the regulation is, is, is not working very well. So, so that's one item that I think they should look at. So my call is uh, for what, what will help the situation. My call is for actually innovation that is based on, on ecosystems that created by universities. So you look at that, for instance, so Silicon Valley, it wouldn't be there without Stanford University. If you look at the, the pharma concentration around MIT, it wouldn't be there without MIT. So Europe, I think, has these kind of concentrations also, but not to the same extent as the U.S. Uh, as, the, uh, as, uh, as the U.S. And so that would be my mode of growth. And, and the one thing that is key for that development is actually to bring in students, young people, to actually drive the effort. Young people have the energy, the ideas, and so young people are at a very central position in terms of driving the startup. In fact, they create alumni create about 900 startups at MIT every year, of which uh, you know current students probably are of the order of 50. So this dynamic comes not from the, you know, it's not MIT that's organizing it or, or such. It is the students. And the same we have seen actually at the Alto University when the way Alto, uh, Alto startup uh, business has been, been developing on the heels or, or on the back of students. And the biggest, uh, biggest event there is, of course, Slush, which is worldwide well-known and one of the largest in the world startup events. But still, that doesn't translate into really big startup businesses, probably because they get sold out too early. So that, that would be my, my, uh, my sort of short take on what the situation is right now. Thank you very much, Bengt. Uh, there's a question popi uh, popping up now for you, Bengt, and it concerns now mobile payments and standardization. So uh, mobile payments, uh, there are many alternative approaches locally and globally. There is no global standard. What does this mean? Is it a threat? Does this accelerate or, or uh, slow down innovation? Well, I think this is one reason that uh, China is uh, developing so fast, because they de facto have standards in the sense that there's WeChat Pay, which is, uh, and there's, uh, there's Alipay, and those two ways of paying are both very similar and, and uh, you can almost everywhere pay with one or the other. If you look at, if you look at the U.S., for instance, you know, you have 10 ways of paying and it, it's very, very, very sort of heterogeneous. Europe is trying to create a standard for this purpose, you know, for, uh, through the payment system uh, directive. But, uh, but I worry that they don't have really a coordinator the right for that purpose. That is, they, they are pretty determined to allow the, the user to, to choose whether to use it or not use it to opt out. They are very concerned about privacy issues. And, and I understand that. But it also has to be understood that uh, if, you, if, you, if you intervene too strongly in regulatory ways, uh, you are just not going to get the ecosystem to start growing. Thank you. Nina, uh, Karl Henrik, do you have questions, comments to Bengt? Not at this point. Not at this point. Karl Henrik? No, I'm fine. It's always exciting to listen to Bengt. Okay. Uh, there's another question coming up for you, Bengt, and this uh, uh, touches what you said about uh, Europe falling behind now what concerns the data world. Uh, so uh, this touches now the issue of uh, technological sovereignty. So how important is that, that uh, the, the technological sovereignty? Are the continents now fighting with each other? Uh, you pointed out that it's a big hazard for Europe to fall 
back, you know, and, and not have sovereignty, for instance, in the data issue. So would you like to expand on that? I don't exactly know what the sovereignty I mean, the data is, is, we are trying to grapple with it in economics. You know, who owns the data? Who should own the data? Mm. You know, what, what, what can it be used for? And so on. data is, has the very unique feature that you can sort of use the same data over and over. If I use the data, that doesn't prevent you from using the same data. Mm. We call it a non-rival good. And this gives enormous scope for welfare because the same, the same piece can be used simultaneously by 100 million people or a billion people at no, almost no additional cost. So this is what is sort of the excitement. And, and, and this is what one would like to uh, use. So I don't know what sovereignty are you talking about, who owns the data or that the, the consumers can sort of prevent the use of data or, or, or is it sovereignty referred to, to countries? I, I, I'm not entirely sure that uh, I, I'm not used to that language in this context. Okay, thank you. And a third uh, question comes up. What about the role of individuals and motivating those individuals to succeed? Innovation and creativity start most often from individuals. And you also pointed out to that when you talked about students. So individuals and small groups. So, so how can we motivate the individuals to really uh, to succeed and go, go towards innovation? And then linked to this, what is then the role of ecosystems? Because individuals cannot thrive alone. They need an ecosystem of peers. So would you like to comment once more on the individual's role and then, then the ecosystem issue, please? Yes, yeah, so I, I, this is my sort of uh, one insight that I wanted to communicate was that, that you know, this, this dynamics is born around universities. And in universities, you know, around actually young people. Uh, so, for instance, the startup business, you know, professors are not very eager to start up businesses because they are, they are, inter they are intellectual entrepreneurs and they are, they are concerned about their reputation more than the money. They are, they are as they should be interested in their ideas, but students, you know, go out there into the, into the commercial world and, and, and they can be educated in the way to, to how you commercialize things. So, you know, Commerce, this transition, this sort of business, business aspect of what you discussed in the beginning is actually teachable. It's not teachable how you invent things, but it is teachable how you actually take it to market, how you expand, you know, uh, and, and so on. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's, and then the mindset is very big, but that's, that's, that would be my best recipe. For, for focusing on it. And as I said, we have already seen at Alto that it doesn't take very long time in the United States to sort of get the idea and go well beyond, in fact, what happens in the United States. I think slush is just a fabulous thing. And, and, and it's totally, you know, done by, by resources, the, organized by the, by the students. And uh, th so these are examples and there's nothing really that prevents U uh, Europe from expanding and, and getting into the game. And, and this, I think, is the, at least this is one of the important pathways. Uh, and, and, and it is, individuals need to be motivated. You know, that's the task of universities. It, it's for us to give young people, uh, you know, inspiration and, and, and the purpose in life. Thank you very much, Bengt. And now we turn to Nina Coppola. You are Director General of Business Finland that supports uh, translation of innovations into business. Uh, you may now start your six minutes, please, Nina. Thank you. Uh, from my behalf as well, I'd like to congratulate the, the winners of the Millennium Prize. Uh, I'm, I'm truly happy to be here and in this panel with very distinguished members. Uh, and my message for today is that innovations save the world. In an open letter to President Barack Obama, New York uh, Times columnist and three times Pulitzer winner Thomas Friedman uh, called out to Obama to create more jobs, Steve Jobs. And uh, in his letter, Friedman wrote, we need to get millions of American kids, not just the geniuses, excited about innovation and entrepreneurship again. And this applies 
not only to the United States of the Obama era, but all over the world. Last year, as we know, the COVID pandemic spread to many parts of the globe, Europe included, infecting countries that were already struggling with weak economies. Real progress in the decade ahead will require creative and fresh new ideas. The key is to keep innovating. History shows that the greatest innovations have been introduced in periods of severe economic stress. Indeed, stress, conflict and necessity seem to be nature's own way of saying, find a new way. Innovation is a new way of doing things that result in positive change. It makes life better. But innovation is also the best way to sustain economic prosperity. Innovation increases productivity, and productivity increases the possibility of higher income, higher profits, new jobs, new products, and a prosperous economy. But we also need heroes. We need those 3% of people who are committed to designing the life of their dreams. Heroes like Jeff Bezos, who changed the way we shop, Elon Musk, who is spearheading the change from gasoline to electric cars, Mark Zuckerberg, who has gathered one third of the population on one social networking platform. They all have one thing in common, relentless innovation. In particular, a small country like Finland needs people who think and dream big. People who have a vision and passion. People with ability to see a solution to a problem. The ability to see over the horizon. And the ability to invest in research, development and innovation to achieve higher economic growth. Economic growth comes from boldly reforming livelihoods so that companies have inspiring solutions for international markets. Solutions that international end customers are willing to buy and pay for. Companies are constantly making small improvements to existing products and service processes. They are introducing new technologies, processes and materials. But we need bolder leaps. We need big innovations. The role of the public sector is to inspire the bravest openings and to inno innovate across existing structures and borders. Furthermore, the role of the public sector is to share the risk of the unknown and to take this risk so high that sometimes there are failures as well. The role of the public sector is linked to making big strides. So why do we need public funding? International comparisons show that those companies that have received reasonable public funding as well as significant private funding were most successful. It has been proven many times over that public innovation funding catalyzes twice as much uh, the amount that uh, the public funding is investing. So for each euro of public money invested, we get double the amounts of euros from the private sector. Thereby, the investment into research and development triples, which already is quite something. And this is how we manage to constantly increase our investments and implement creative ideas into business plans and build something new. We only manage when we are able to constantly renew and generate more value for our customers. The greatest potential for growth is related to solving the global challenges mankind faces. It relates to solving climate change challenge, utilizing digitalization to increase productivity and social transition, among others. Business Finland implements a strategic innovation policy that ensures the quantity and quality of research and development activities are at an adequate level for the society as a whole. We believe in companies' ability to innovate new solutions for the global market at a time when competition is intensifying. Innovations cannot occur in the absence of passion. Without passion, you have little hope of creating breakthrough ideas. Innovation requires creativity and energy. Loving what you do is the fuel that you need to keep working. Let me conclude with the words of Steve Jobs. Let's go invent tomorrow instead of wondering of what happened yesterday. Thank you very much, uh, Nina.
Now, uh, here I have a question uh, for you, uh, which, which uh, is as follows. Now, uh, what happened uh, during the COVID crisis in the area of research was tremendous acceleration of delivery of research findings, research results. And at the same time, a new culture emerged, and this is a culture of sharing sharing of data. And this is the reason, for instance, uh, 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 why we have this unprecedentedly rapid development of vaccines. So my question or the question uh, for you is whether uh, anything has happened in the uh, amongst the companies of this sort. So has the pandemic perhaps catalyzed the sharing of data between the companies? I don't know if the sharing of the data has uh transpired into the companies in the same way. If something, the pandemic has intensified the competition. Everybody is looking when is the com pandemic over and how will we be in the game afterwards. Having said that, I, I do think that companies are more ad adept to creating these kind of ecosystems that also uh, uh, Bengt Holmson was talking about. So to go together where there is complementary knowledge and that has uh, quickened the pace of innovation because I do believe also the companies were involved in creating the new vaccines yes. uh, because innovation obviously is a commercialized invention right yes. so so I think the the cooperation there has intensified yes so there is a clear shift as well in the private sector uh, now of course we have to recognize that there was a lot of money for research is available yes. because of this pandemic so that of course was one of the accelerating factors so, uh, uh, Bengt uh, and Sven and Carl Henrik, if you have any comments, please alert me and uh, speak up. Any questions? Yeah, the, o the only comment I would do is, is back to Bengt's comment about sovereignty. I, I think this is, this is a, a key point. And I just think it's important that we, that we recognize that sovereignty in the sense of resilience that we in conflicts, that we can feed our nation with, with food that we have access to healthcare and whatever that those are important but there is a very short step from resilience to protectionism mm. and i think if we go the protectionistic mm. way in this world it's not going to be good very interesting point so there's a sensitive balance there between sovereignty and, and protectionism thank you uh, another question then to you, uh, Nina, and uh, here uh, the question reads as follows. You mentioned Facebook Zuckerberg as a good example of innovation and data sharing as inherently helpful. But what about negative external uh, uh, negative issues, issues of public trust, for instance, in, in, mm. in the yeah. uh, issue of Facebook? So do you have a comment there, Nina? Yeah, uh, perhaps two, two sides to this thing. The, the Data, the innovation and the data sharing is something, or the importance of data, as also was pointed out by Bengt Holmström earlier, is something we cannot get back from. That is there already. Data is being shared. Data, data usage has intensified. That is the way the society is going. Uh, however, of course, with every innovation, there is a dark side. And, and that then is up to the society, it's up to the innovators, it's up to everybody to uh, minimize the dark effects of, of the innovations that might, might occur. So it, it, I'm not talking about uh, Zuckerberg, as if, if he, I'm talking about that he is an innovator, constantly innovating. Mm. If then the innovation is used in a bad way, that of course is not what I'm mm. looking for. But I believe that is true, perhaps I'm generalizing too much, but for at least most of the innovation, they can also be used in a wrong way. Mm. And, and this is of course something that we have to uh, fight. Yes, and of course legislation is, is a strong tool against the dark side of, of yes. technologies, as you say. But then the thing is that first come the new technologies and only thereafter then uh, uh, society starts to think about, I mean, the public debate and then the politicians yes. look at the legislation that is needed. So legislation always is late. So uh, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, uh, Nina, uh, your thoughts about the European Innovation Council. Now in Horizon Europe, the EIC, the European Innovation Council has 
10 billion euros for academic researchers which develop uh, breakthrough technologies and for SMEs, startups to grow, for innovative ones. And uh, uh, the EIC has also uh, uh, catalyzed the creation of a private fund, an EIC fund, which is already very quickly become the uh, Europe's largest deep tech investor. At the moment it has some 3 uh, billion euros and, and they of course provide equity for projects that are not sufficiently mature for, for private uh, uh, investors. So uh, do you see a connection and synergy perhaps between business Finland and the, and the European level uh, efforts? Of course, if you talk about the EIC uh, specifically, Business Finland doesn't do equity investments. But anyway, the, as a public funder, we see, and I, I believe the view is shared by other public funding agencies, that the EIC is a good add-on, it's a good addition. Uh, and certainly it can help to uh, paint Europe uh, as a good place for deep tech startups to be created because if funding is available and it can help Europe also come out of the, the aftermath of the pandemic. But we also have to remember that public venture funding is important as well because when public money goes into a company typically it's not only money it is the networks it's the knowledge that the funder or the 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 the, the mon money, money investors have uh, and they help the startup to, to grow, to, to get to the next level and the next level. So I think it's a good add-on, but we shouldn't see it as the only salvage. Mm. I think it's the private and the, again, the public European money has to play mm. together mm. for the best effect. Thank you. And now we turn to you, Carl henrik Svanberg. As a chair of the European Roundtable of Industrialists, you have a continent-wide knowledge and understanding of large industries, priorities and needs and trends. The floor is yours, Karl Henrik, please. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thanks for inviting me and let me speak at this very prestigious event. I, I uh, congratulate, of course, also the winners. And as Nina said, you are the heroes of our, our time. Uh, let me just first start uh, 130, 40 years back at the Industrial Revolution. I think we can learn a lot from that. That was a time when we took the, our, our, our societies from agriculture to, to industrial and everything changed. And, and it, it was a drama. And of course, what, really what, what was really success stories like rolling out electricity, telephony, building railroads, building roads, it was a lot about investing in infrastructure. It was a lot about info innovation, often together between governments and states, uh, states and companies. It was about uh, entrepreneurs that was really doing uh, everything with, with the new opportunities. I think we can learn from that because I think the recipe is the same. We, we are now at a, a, a very changing times, dramatic times, where uh, we have the digital revolution, of course, that would change everything we do. Every way we live, we take care of our elderly, we study, we, we, we work. We also have the climate uh, uh, challenge. And, and, and uh, I think we can also agree that there will be no green success unless there is a digital success. Because there are digital ideas behind almost every, every green idea. Uh, we, we have also a changing geopolitical world uh, where, where it's not clear now how exactly it will pay out between play out between US and China to what extent they will be able to cooperate on certain important issues and be, or it would just be hard competition and Europe need to navigate here between between the two so what is now the recipe for uh, uh, for succeeding in this new digital era I think it comes back to, to much the same as last time. We have to invest. We have to invest in infrastructure. Uh, we, we, we are, for example, in, in uh, 5G rollouts, in investments in AI. We are significantly behind US and, and China. Uh, China invests three, four times more on AI. We invest, uh, US invests probably eight, nine times more than, than we do in, in Europe. This is, this is, of course, not good. Uh, we are slow in the rollout of 5G. That is uh, tomorrow's highways. 
Um, the only thing I can say is that this race is long. So, so even though we're up to a, a slow start, I think we would still a lot of time to, uh, to catch up. Uh, we also have a major uh, reskilling, upskilling challenge uh, with the entire uh, populations. Uh, some estimate 100 million needs to be upskilled by 2030. This could be a home turf for, for Europe because we are good at ed education for the many. We are good at vocational training for upskilling of our staffs and companies. But it's of course about also supporting the, the entrepreneurs. And uh, you know, entrepreneurs, I think it's a well-known truth that entrepreneurs, they don't learn uh, entrepreneurship in universities and schools. They learn from other entrepreneurs. It's incredibly important to create forums where they come together and, and, and they can share their experience. They can get, uh, they can get inspiration from one another. Um, in this context also, I think the ecosystems are key, as, as Bengt and, and also uh, Nina talked about. Uh, the ecosystems, if I look at, for example, uh, Ericsson, where I used to be the CEO, where I look at Nokia, there are a lot of, of, of people employed in these companies, but there are equally many of startups and, and, and uh, smaller companies around there that wouldn't be there if the big ones weren't there. So the combination of the small and the big is, is crucial here also. I think the entrepreneurial culture is key. If we if we look at uh, if we look at Europe, uh, the entrepreneurial culture is actually quite good. In in the further north you come, if we come to the the Nordics here, like Sweden and Finland, the entrepreneurship is great. It's not as good. There are more harder structures to break down the, the further south you come. Uh, I don't think we should be too worried because this is growing. Uh, if you look at America, it's great in entrepreneurship, but it's tech in, in Silicon Valley and it's pharma in Boston. But if you come to southern US, it, it's not that dramatic either. If you go to, to China, you have a great entrepreneurship in Shenzhen, but not everywhere in China. So, so, But we need to foster that and we need to remember that if you talk about Steve Jobs, who who walked bare feet until he was 30 and, and, and were basically feeding on, on uh, carrots until his skin turned orange and, and encouraged students in his university speeches to test LSD. I mean, the, many of the real entrepreneurs, they are rebels. They are questioning everything and, and therefore don't necessarily see our institutions as the greatest thing to, 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 to mingle in and participate in. Venture capital, is, is uh, often considered short, I wouldn't be too worried. They are like bloodhounds. They sniff a good, a good opportunity. So, so they will always be there when needed. So these are my, my, my thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Carl Henrik. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned upskilling and entrepreneurship. So, so the first question concerns uh, entrepreneurship education. Do the universities have a role here? And if they should have a role, are they fulfilling that role effectively? I think it's a, it, you can't answer easily on that because I think it's, it's very uh, different from, from place to place. Uh, we spend a lot of time in Boston, actually, as Bank well knows. And if you look at MIT and their media lab, if you look at uh, many universities in, in the US, they are playing that role. You can come to other, other universities elsewhere in the world and it's not much at all. So I think it's, it's a huge difference. But, but as I said, entrepreneurship is, they learn from one another. So creating the meeting places where they can, where they can get inspired by, by each other, mm. I think is key. Mm. And, 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 and I think teachers like uh, Bengt are inspiring to meet. Mm. Uh, and I think teachers' roles here uh, is actually key. Do you have a comment uh, to this issue, uh, Bengt? Uh, yes, I, I'm, uh, I'm reacting a little bit to the question of bloodhounds. I think I, th I do think that the VCs play a more important role. In fact, I don't think of VCs as contributing money. I think of VCs as actually being the sparring partners and, and, and the, the mentors for, for these startups. They are high paid and in a peculiar way paid 
uh, employees, so to speak, or, 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 or shareholders of this, uh, of this enterprise. I don't know if you agree with this, but, uh, but that, that, that money part is sort of the small piece of it. And, and, and the advisee and connection part, which plays such a crucial role in, in Silicon Valley and also, also around MIT. Uh, no, but I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's not not the money per se, although they are of course investors for returns. But I just mean that when you find when you have people with great ideas that are are, are looking for support and and looking, then 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 venture capital people find you and they, they contribute with experienced uh, uh, people that that can help coaching and stuff. But I think if we can get the innovation going, we will always get support from venture capital. Then a few words about upskilling that you mentioned, Carl Henrik. Here yeah. in Finland, it has been a big debate, you know, who should pay and organize upskilling a workforce? Is it the employer who should pay for this? Is it the universities? Now, in fact, here in Finland, am I not right, uh, Nina, the Ministry of, of Education and Research and Culture has established, or I mean, it has been their uh, activity established a special uh, uh, unit who will be charged with organizing upskilling a workforce. So is there a good solution? How does Sweden uh, now manage with the upskilling issue of, of the workforce? Well, I, I think, and, and this is actually, if I look at the European World Table also, where we are 60, the 60 biggest companies of Europe, industrial companies, uh, skilling, upskilling for for companies, I think, is the responsibility of the companies. We, we, uh, I think the it must be so that we take care of our own employees, then bring them through their career in a in a life learning, lifelong learning uh, responsibility. Um, the question is more those that are outside the labor market that are risking losing their jobs or, or, or what do we do there? And, the, and of course, then society comes back, uh, back in play here. Mm -hmm. But I think we should remember that we have a tradition in Europe of taking care of our employees in companies, of, of uh, education for the many. If you look at China and the US, there tradition is if you if you if you're not uh, useful in the company you can you can be be laid off mm -hmm. and then it's your task to find a way forward in that society that doesn't do much it's for you to grab the opportunities mm -hmm. uh, that creates maybe sometimes a more mm -hmm. driving force because uh, you have to take care of your own destiny uh, but i think in in this upskilling in this time of, of, of upskilling needs I think the European model, uh, where where governments and states and, and companies work in with their respective roles, I think is an asset to to uh, our competitiveness. Um, Nina, do you have a question? Well, I have a general question. When listening to the two gentlemen, or or a thought actually that I would want to put out, if Please. that's okay. Yes. Uh, I think both gentlemen were talking about Europe versus others. Uh, and how we are behind in the game somehow that we are we don't have the big tech companies that's totally true i mean uh, none of the 10 largest by market cap are european we don't put as much money into developing ai 5g even though we could have a really good benefit here because we have two companies in even in the nordics that have the 5g technology and and uh, we we could benefit from that and I, I, I'm not scared as such, but I think we are losing an opportunity here in Europe. Are we too complacent? Are we, are we considering us as the developed world and everything is fine and we have bread on the, or, or butter on the bread and we don't need any more to, to make an effort? Or, or why, perhaps the thought, why are we not up to the game? Because I don't think we are more stupid, we don't have less money. Uh, what is it that we lack? Carl mm. Henrik, what do you say? Well, I, I think clearly we are, uh, we are uh, off to a slow start. And that can make 
like Nina, that can make anyone nervous. Uh, I think we, the only thing we have going for us is that it is a long race. <laughs> uh, and I think we have a better educated population on average. The elite universities in China and US are, are probably better, but, but the, many, the, the many in the workforce are, are, uh, are uh, better educated and I think are, are better ready for the changes. But it is true that we are behind. Of, of the 70 biggest uh, companies by market cap today, the, the, the unicorns, tech unicorns, there are five in Europe, and, and they are over 100 years old. And, and the Americans uh, and the Chinese making up the other 70, 60, uh, 65, they are less than 20. So, so this, is a, this is a matter, and it has probably something to do also with the fact that we are still, Europe is still uh, sort of fragmented. But, but the tendencies, in, especially in the northern part of Europe, is positive. You agree? Can I, can I make a comment? Yes, of course. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, what Carl Hendrik said at the end, I think, is very critical. It's sort of unfair to compare EU as if it were one country against, you know, Europe, mm -hmm. uh, against US and China, which are one country. So, I think what has not been realized at the EU level is the common market. And that's another place where I would really focus my attention. So to sort of fulfill the dream about the common market or fairly fri frictionless market. Because uh, you don't get a big platform economy growing here because, uh, because there are just not, you know, there's all sorts of barriers. There's language barriers, there's, you know, various customs and other things. So, so I think that that is, that is not a trivial issue. It's, it's a big issue. and, and, and uh, and uh, there is, it's not in sight, of course, that it will become a united Europe anytime soon. So I, th I think that challenge has to be recognized mm. when we speak about the EU. Mm. There's a comment from uh, uh, the audience. The main problem in Europe is not a lack of startups. It is that they will be acquired by US or Chinese companies. What yes, can we do that, about that? That's exactly right. Yeah. So what's your remedy? That's exactly that? right. I think I think that's one of the key reasons that Supercell is a good example. Mm. You know that would be on the list of 100, mm. but it was sold to Chinese for 80 percent is now owned by Tencent, mm. and you know the same happens to to was you. And it's an indication that we don't have you know the follow up venture capital capitalist that say 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 mill around in U.S. at least, and 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 China is run differently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the, one of the reasons why the European Innovation Council was established to give resources to startups here in Europe so that they are not uh, uh, sold. And, and it is a remedy, like I said, and actually, uh, and, and to the point that it cannot be the only money because we need the, the networks, the knowledge that the, the venture capitalists bring to the, but it, it, it's an add on, it can share the risk possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, will it help it? Well, it's, it's one remedy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I can see that there's a lot of uh, questions about data in the chat, uh, but I cannot see them individually now. So let me at this point uh, uh, ask about the Green Deal, Carl uh, uh, Henrik. So uh, uh, for the big companies, is this uh, for real? Uh, is it lip service, Green Deal and sustainability? Uh, what is, uh, if and when companies are taking this on, what is really the driving force behind that? Uh, let me just comment a little bit on data first. Uh, just, just okay, uh, 30 please, seconds. Okay, please, go ahead. But yes. the, you have, I think there is a, uh, data, uh, data is becoming the, a new really critical asset. And uh, th there is a, I think if we think about the use of internet, in the American way, basically everything is allowed, unless specifically said it's forbidden, but basically everything is allowed. It's, a, uh, it's, it's not a lot of rules. If you go to, and, and in America, it's also perceived that the, the ownership of the data is these big data companies, Facebook and Google and what have you. 
uh, if you take China, there basically nothing is allowed unless specifically said so. And the owners of the data is basically the government. In Europe, I think there's a culture or a thinking, a general thinking that the data is ours as users. Uh, and I think there is a need uh, for better game rules in how we create a safer internet, how we create a safer uh, regula regulatory framework around data. This is something where Europe can and should, and I think will, step up the game because we we have a better tradition on these kind of regulatory frameworks and standardization so i think that that could be a positive thing on, on the data side mm -hmm. if you come to the green deal i think my sense is that companies have passed in a way uh, i shouldn't use the tipping point in a, a wrong way but a, a tipping point here if i look at volvo that i'm sharing uh, from sort of having a bottom-up approach where we say we will also start to to launch electric trucks and, and so on. You do it so from where we are. We do our best and, and see how we can mm -hmm. be innovative. That have changed to a top-down approach, basically saying that we, we understand and accept fully a fossil-free world 2050. That means we have to stop selling fossil uh, cars, trucks, by 2040, because they typically run for 10 years. That means we have to be halfway by 2030. And from there, we have a very distinct plan with the absolute determination to sell only fossil-free uh, trucks and vehicles by 2040. I can see a total uh, uh, consensus around this, at least on, among the 60 biggest companies we gather in, in, uh, in the European Roundtable. This is serious business now. We're not debating whether this is going to mm -hmm. be, if we believe in climate change, if we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. We are determined to get there. And, and, and we think that that is a positive for the world, but we also think there are business opportunities to go that way. Yes. Uh, what about. Uh uh, the role of a sort of a generational shift of consumers who now have their own opinions what to buy, what to consume based now on the climate issues, etc. So companies are taking that into consideration as well? Oh, oh big time. I think you will find, for example, that, that if we sell a fossil free truck, that is good, uh, and, and a, a fleet owner, a truck owner, will look at the total cost of ownership and is, is that competitive and that, that's where he's coming from. But if you say, let's say, sell a completely green truck with carbon-free steel and what have you, so you can actually, as a fleet owner, you can market a service that is completely green. Well, now you start to compete about the value of this freight service from a consumer's perspective. And, and that's a totally different game. I think when the consumers get into the picture, then you get a totally different driving force for the change. Now, by the way, any uh, questions to any of the panelists uh, on any of the topics they have uh, touched upon are welcome. Uh, I'm reading one of the audience's uh, questions now to you. How can legislation and innovation do better together uh, to increase inefficiency, uh, so that increase in efficiency doesn't come at the expense of data privacy? Would anybody wish to comment that? Well, I, th I think that is, uh, that is a debate that needs to be made. I, I would say that uh, the first thing is to understand that one has to weigh positives as well as negatives, and one has to look at what can. One of the problems with the, with the GDPR regulation, which is the data protection regulation in Europe, is that it treats size as the determining factor. But actually, there's an enormous difference about privacy between, say, social media which I find very scary, and I would regulate much more heavily, perhaps, than, say, Google and Apple and these, you know, I don't, these are completely two different animals, and they need to be regulated totally differently with respect to privacy. 
I don't think Google has ever really abused uh, abused in any significant way data. But but as we have seen, you know, uh, Facebook and, and these uh, social media parts, they're not just privacy issues. They are they are you know revolutions. Mm. You know, we see Trump's mm. Trump's case. You know, is pretty scary at least for somebody who lives here here in the United States. I mean, something needs to be done, in my view, on that uh, on that dimension. And those are two very different things. So I, I think uh, this uniform, this regulation isn't really well thought through in my view. Okay, I, I, just one, one point there, because if you look at um, Margaret Vestager, who is the, one of the commissioners in the, in the EU, she used to be the commissioner for competition policy. And she, she used to, uh, in, a, in a more anecdotal way, look at herself as the police for, for competition uh, law and, 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 uh, and how it was followed. Her role is now enlarged. So she has both that role, but she also has digital in general, which means innovation, if you like. And, and as she says that I have to get used to my role now because I'm both the police and the coach for driving this forward in a positive way. And I think there is this dilemma between legislation and innovation. And I think it's important when you come to the political side of it that, that those that have the responsibility actually are faced with both at the same time. So they, they do get supportive and not one another's enemies. Nina? Yeah, uh, perhaps I go back to the Green Deal discussion, if I may, a little of bit. Because uh, I think it's changed. Uh, I have a history in process industry for many, many years. And it used to be the way that it was only an investment. It wasn't something that you wanted to do, but you had to do, because otherwise there were fines and whatnot. Nowadays, I, I feel that companies see this as a competitive advantage, or they can create a competitive advantage, because it is driven by consumers or, and by, by users of the technology. So if you want to have something special, you need a, typically an innovation in order to have a product that the customers, be they businesses or consumers, want to pay more for. And thereby, if your process, your products are more environmentally friendly or less environmental harmly than other, that brings you a competitive advantage. And I believe this is now in the company's DNAs. And that's why, as I said, innovations save the world. It's through the innovations that we get these new processes, new products that are better for the environment, that are not harming as, as the old solutions, mm -hmm. and that we are also with technology innovations able to bring the cost to a, to a place so that the productivity of the company can, can survive. So all of this requires a wealth of new information that is created both in universities but also in companies. Mm. And, uh, uh, but I don't see anybody disagreeing that, that this has to be done. Mm. So I believe that we are going towards a better place. Yeah. So uh, Carl henrik and Nina, uh, to me, it seems that you perfectly agree about this uh, issue. Ben, do you have uh, uh, something to say about the Green Deal? Green transition? Well, you know, Carl Hendrik and we have met many times in, in, in the context of corporate governance. And, and uh, my comment is, uh, is to cite, uh, cite the fact that, or make the observation that uh, it is true that uh, that you know the, the public and the opinion and, and the pressure on on companies really is having an effect. Actually, the driver, I believe, and Carl Henry, correct me if I'm wrong. It's actually the investing community. You know, the Black Rocks and big in the institutional investors that are sort of throwing their weight around and saying that the company has to really, the board has to really take action. Mm -hmm. And and so the pressure is coming a lot from investors, of course, originally from the buyers. But the idea is that they believe that there can be a big risk if one don't don't take actions or react to this public opinion and so on. But uh, but uh, it is a win-win. The interesting thing is that uh, this pressure now has been channeled through the institutional investors to become sort of a win-win to be green. And, and so it, 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 it increases your, your, your market value as a company, 
at the same time as it makes it greener. And this was actually something Milton Friedman, uh, who we don't think of in the context of green, you know, uh, he was saying that this is what's going to happen. That is that, that it's actually channeled through the self-interest of the company will actually drive this. Uh, this uh, once they realize that, that the pressure, you know, people stop buying the goods and, and, and backlashes come and so on. I'm not saying this is this is a hundred percent channel, but I'm saying that it's interesting to see that this this channel is, in my view, playing itself out uh, in in the way Friedman actually said. Thank you. Now I see that there is a lot of comments and questions about the ecosystem issue in the chat. So, so uh, one is. Um, touches the issue of the balance between competition and collaboration in an ecosystem. Isn't the question how you manage and regulate that, this balance of competition and collaboration in ecosystems? Yes, yeah. please. We are working a lot with creating, initiating, trying to get ecosystems going. And uh, I believe, as I think my colleagues in the, in, the, in the panel also believe in the ecosystemic way of working. Uh, there can be an ecosystem driven more by a university and then perhaps startups forming around. Can be an ecosystem driven by a large company where you have research institutes, small startups, perhaps even competitors joining. Mm -hmm. The driving force in an ecosystem is that uh, they are trying to solve a similar problem that is bringing a solution or, or is beneficial for all of the participants in the ecosystem. Mm. So I don't think that you have to really regulate it as such because the common interest of the ecosystem is driving the players together. And uh, I, I believe it can be a, a true force, as I think both of, of, of the colleague panelists were saying, either from a little more from the research side or the company side, but still there has to be a driver there. There has to be one um, major player who is actually initiating and driving the ecosystem forward. Apart from that, I believe then everybody is coming together and working for the same agenda. Yeah. And it can be truly beneficial for all the participants, both the bigger, the smaller, the research institutes that are participating in the ecosystem. And uh, this is a, a good way of, of going forward. Mm. And the definition of an ecosystem in nature is, of course, that uh, the, the uh, different elements benefit from each other. So there's a comment, in nature ecosystems are often, often self-organizing or maybe always self-organizing. So you also mentioned this, Nina, that it has to be, there has to be an idea, initiators, self-organizing uh, then starts, but then there are means and ways for, for uh, then, for instance, public money to, to uh, assist and help. But the essence has to come from the, from the initiators. Uh, Bengt, Karl Henrik, do you wish to elaborate more on the ecosystem issue? Well, I, yeah, I can I say like what, what. Yeah, please, Bengt. Bengt, please. Now, you, you go ahead. I, I say, I agree with Nina that there has to be, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable thing if they have a shared objective. Uh, but, but, you know, one thing to realize is that companies are big time regulators. <laughs> in the sense that they regulate what's happening inside the company. And sometimes they set the rules for the interactions between companies and so on. So, so you know, uh, sort of, it does, most of the regulation in some sense happens inside companies, is my view. And, and, uh, and in that respect, China is interesting because uh, it's actually Alibaba and WeChat and these, they, they have big ecosystems, yes, but, but they are setting the rules for the platforms, you know, the, the, these companies. And there's enough competition to make these rules apparently pretty efficient. So, so that's one way of looking, or that's how, say, contract theory would look at this. Uh, and and, and uh, because, yeah, but it helps, like Nina said, you know, it helps to have a shared objective. Mm -hmm. But usually there needs to be a a key player also. Carl Hendrik, please. Yeah, uh, and like you remember, Bengt, if you go to telecoms, for example, 
no company like Ericsson or Nokia or, or whoever can invent 5G on their own. So, so in that industry, many companies that participate, they do a part of the research and development. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of, those that have made more research and development will then receive contributions for the others and vice versa. Uh, if you then think about the, so in, in that sense, the ecosystem is absolutely key or the collaboration and doesn't, it's not harming competition that then is fierce when the products are being sold. If you think about building trucks, that's always been something you've done in your own company. You developed it, you produced it, it's your own, you never show a customer, what a competitor, what you do. Now that we go electric, there are components that a single company can't just do. And, and you may have seen that Volvo and Daimler, two fierce competitors, are now in a joint venture to develop fuel cells, which is a, an alternative to batteries when batteries can't can't uh, charge, uh, can't uh, run a truck from coast to coast in America, you need fuel cells. So I think you will see there are areas where you have to come together and, and then you compete with a, with a product and, and, and how you build it and how you use the technology. One other yes. point perhaps is uh, I think uh, if you think about the innovation process, I think it was Schumpeter already said that innovation is not linear. And, and in an ecosystem, the innovation truly happens in an iterative process because in an ecosystem you can have uh, perhaps a research institute, you have the, the one who's creating the product and perhaps the user and the end user already all together. So, so the innovation is, is mm. created in a much more efficient way, not so that it goes in, in, a, mm. in, a, in a linear fashion where yeah. one does, tries to make it ready and then to the next one and to the next one. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that also makes, makes it, uh, the innovation process much more efficient. Mm. Now, shall we uh, talk a little bit about industry academia collaboration? So, um, is it okay as it is today or should it be intensified? And now it's clear, of course, that uh, researchers whose research would be relevant for, for industry and for, for translation may not be aware of the high ambition level that industries may have, which would be inspiring for the researchers, and there is no exposure necessarily to, to industries, to companies. And then again, uh, companies, industries, uh, uh, some know and, and some don't that uh, uh, researchers may be able to provide solutions. So are we happy with this uh, interaction as it is today? My understanding is that it's not, of course it varies from country to country, but uh, and, uh, my view is on, is on Europe that uh, this interaction is not as strong as it could be. So do we have comments on this, uh, Sven? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Carl Henrik, please, if you start. Well, I, I, it clearly it's important, um, and and if I look at Ericsson, for example, with its cooperation with the Swedish universities, if I look at Volvo with Chalmers and and, and, and vehicle technology, if I look at BP and their the collaboration, for example, with with MIT and lots of lots of universities, I think this is key, and 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 I think it should not be underestimated. It, the, the university's role to, to, be, to be free it, it has to be guarded at every time and, and not be steered and, 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 and such, but, but it is important. Here there is a big difference to, to China, I believe, where, where the Chinese universities are much more task-oriented for their companies in a, in a more, more countrywide strategy that, that aligns the forces to, to make faster progress. That has other disadvantages, but, but here there, there is a difference. Bengt? Well, one thing I would add is that uh, at MIT we have seen over the years uh, uh, that that when a new industry builds up, for instance, when telecom came and you know these uh, phone companies came, Nokia came to the, had a, had a laboratory on on, on campus. That uh, that it's critical that the, the the money is just a small part of the con contribution. You know, they they invest say a million dollars or $10 million or whatever they do. And then in the beginning, they sort of just sat back and waited for the university to 
bring something that was worth 10 million. Actually, 10 million is just a small down payment. You have to send people there. You have to invest with people. And I'm, I'm sure that's what uh, what uh, Carl Hendrik has experienced and seen in, 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 in Europe. And of course, that was true also for Nokia, that they had a close co collaboration with the university and it was people mm. from the company working with people. So, so the human investment was huge. Mm. But when they came to when, when, when they came to the US, uh, it wasn't as easy to, to do the same thing. But that's, that's critical for this relationship to develop. Mm. It's, it's, it's about people. Yes. Nina, um, what is the situation in Finland? Well, uh, lately there's been quite a lot of talk about the decreasing amount of cooperation between universities and companies. And uh, people have been looking for reasons for that. Uh, it is true that uh, we don't have as many startup, high tech startups coming out of universities than perhaps in other countries. And, and uh, is it a question of money or is it a question of people? That I don't have the solution for that. Uh, we in Finland are not, we, the investment, total investment into R&D is not growing either so I, I'm wondering if that is actually rather the solution and it's hampering the cooperation between university mm -hmm. and and the companies but as Bengt was saying I don't believe it's only a question of money mm -hmm. so is it a question of lack of common targets then we come back to the ecosystemic way of working and trying to find those common uh, interesting topics because the university obviously has its own task as well and, and their own uh, their, their sovereignty has to be guarded, as, as also mm. was said. Mm. There's a very interesting example uh, in Europe of uh, two universities which enjoy, of course, the autonomic status of universities. I will soon tell you which ones they are. But they have a legal obligation, it's written in the law, to contribute to the economic growth of Switzerland. And here we are talking about ETH Zurich and EPFL, which both are absolutely splendid what comes to uh, fundamental research quality and absolutely splendid what comes now to industry academia collaboration. And the campuses, uh, you can see how they strive. These are true ecosystems. So for me, it's very interesting that there is at least one example in Europe where it's in the law. Okay, uh, there's another question now. What should the role of the EU investment be uh, versus national investments? Today, one-fifth of public money supporting R&D comes from the EU budget. Is this true? Yeah, I wonder if this is really for Finland. I don't believe that that is the yeah. case. Adam, Finland is not a very good... Uh, how, how you say winner it? winner in, in the <laughs> EU game, which we are trying hard to, of course, mm. increase. Mm. Uh, it is a source of, of uh, investment money to the R and D, mm. and which should be used as efficiently mm. as possible. It is a com mm. it's competitive, of course. So all mm. the EU countries are competing mm. for the same money. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't go equally to all the countries. Mm. So our time starts to be up and uh, I tried to capture a couple of messages from this discussion. Individual talent, skills, passion, this is key. Translation of research findings uh, to innovation requires public investment. And venture capital then uh, for companies comes later when they can tolerate the risk. Uh, individual innovators and companies are not viable or less viable in isolation but need this ecosystem as we have discussed. And during the current crisis, then uh, new cultures are, are emerging, both in the research uh, uh, domain and, and in the private sector. So I would like to close by, uh, of course, thanking you and the audience, those who have delivered us, us questions, our rapporteur. And I would like to close by just noting that the Millennium Technology Prize winners are a perfect example of this, this little summary. So in their case, from original research findings to groundbreaking technology, which has created global new market, and they are contributing with this technology to mitigation of fatal health challenges, and they contribute to growth and societal resilience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you to all the contributors. Um, uh, and of course, the fast-writing rapporteur. Um, fine work. Um,
Now, stay where you are as we move on to the first Future Bazaar session. Um, I'll tell you a bit about how this works. Uh, it's a 45-minute session. You can choose to visit the Partner Lounge. The forum's partner organizations offer informal one-to-one -one meetings. There are top representatives of industry, universities, government decision makers. Um, on Brella, it's a click partners on the, on the left, so uh, down here somewhere. Um, in parallel, there are three pairs of virtual visits. Um, on Brella, that's schedule, again, to the left. Um, organizations that are lifting the lid on their operations you can learn a lot about what they do and, and how. Um, these are con consecutive 15-minute slots you can choose in each between two organizations' virtual visits. Uh, the first pair is Metza Group or Weissela, then Neste Corporation or Halton Group, uh, and then Alto University or Nokia Corporation. Now, don't worry if you'd like to see both that are in any particular slot, because the next Future Bazaar session will run in the same way, so you can choose the ones that you missed. So we will see you back here at 11.15. Happy exploring.